So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our Zoom meeting. So Dr. Rebecca uh, will be moderating the meeting today. So I can to Dr. Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nader. Um, so as I mentioned today, mainly we're going to be talking about the IRB review process in the poster presentations, uh, during which I'll be sharing one of my posters that I worked in. Um, as um, I'm going to present it, so it's going to, and then we're going to talk on the presentation parts one by one. And uh, so for the beginning today, it's going to be only me presenting. Um, so the first thing I'll talk about is the IRB review process. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see. All right. Um, so the IRB is, like to begin with, the IRB is the Institutional Review Board. Um, it's the board that uh, usually in each um, institute that's responsible of protecting humans, protecting or making sure that the research goes well. So um, it's the body that uh, full uh, that makes sure that um, they fulfill their goal, which is uh, to protect human research participants and support the design and the conduct of a sound research by reviewing and approving the IRB submission for new applications and amendments and continuing reviews. Um, all the projects that meet the definition of research with a human subject must be reviewed and approved by the IRB, or either uh, received an exempt as we come to learn later on, uh, exempt determination the, the prior to beginning a research. Um, so the IRB, like the processes that the IRB staff initially, they do screens. Usually people do submit protocols to the IRB or we call it proposal uh, uh, in other settings. So um, the IRB staff initially screens the submission, uh, the submitted proposals or the protocols to determine the completeness and, and the appropriateness of the type of the review. Okay, so the submission may be returned to the study team for changes before before the review re the review type is later on determined or assigned. The review type may be reassessed at any time during the review process. So basically it's that um, the protocol or the, the th or the proposal for the uh, project that the specific uh, members of the institute wants to conduct, uh, basically um, it's um, evaluated for its appropriateness, evaluated for its uh, respect for the human subject, evaluated if it meets the right uh, criteria for conducting a research. Um, and then after that, um, the review itself is, you know, is divided into many types and based on the content of the information that was present within the, uh, um, the protocol itself or the proposal itself, then it's deter determined if this uh, research is supposed to be exempted, this research is supposed to be, you know, the review type is later on determined, I mean. Um, so... The types of the IRB reviews are either, as I mentioned, it's a comprehensive. Uh, that means like they have to go through everything or it's exempted. That means like the research project does not require an IRB review or the research is not regulated. That means like it does not even, you know, has to go through the um, review process. And later on, everything going to come into place. I mean, like in terms of understanding those concepts. Um, and everyone has a specific criteria that I will touch on later on. So the type of IRB review and the associated review process, it's easier. Um, it's a full board review. Um, I mean, like it does take its time. Uh, it's not something that's exhibited or anything, or it's easier exhibited for certain reasons, or it's a limited IRB review. 
or it's a system generated review. And this is all determined by what? Uh, it's determined by the level of risk to, to the research participants or the types of research being conducted, such as in, um, is it an educational research or educa educational intervention? Or is it a survey? Is it an ethnographic observations? Something like that. Um, also the sensitivity of the research questions or the complexity of the research designs uh, being put into the considerations uh, to putting the, 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 you know, the protocol or the project to, to be, you know, uh, categorized to which part of the review or uh, the involvement of a vulnerable populations as a research participants, such as prisoners and minors, uh, the use of um, identifiable information or in in the um, inidentifiable biospecimen. Uh, so this is actually um, usually researchers they do uh, overcome this by um, you know by using an, an encryption or you know using other stuff that um, does not allow the information to be identified. Uh, also, the applicability of a one or more of the criteria for exempt or or exhibited review. So all this put into consideration determine the type of the review that um, the protocol or the specific research uh, project uh, will be assigned to. Um, so let's start with the research that requires a comprehensive IRB uh, review. Uh, the IRB may conduct either an exhibited or a full board review for IRB regulated research proposed in the interaction or intervention or secondary use of application type to ensure that the risk to the subjects are minimal um, and are reasonable in relation to the anticipated benefits. Uh, the subject selection is equitable. The privacy and confidentiality are protected. Uh, the informed consent uh, process meet the federal regulation and add, um, you know, and requirement of the specific institute. Um, I mainly use the University of Michigan, um, you know, IRB review, um, you know, process uh, to, to provide an example um, here because uh, usually each institute has the, their different um, IRB, um, you know, reviewing process. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the comprehensive one is the one that makes sure that all those aspects are met. Um, even the exhibited one uh, requires that um, all those aspects are met, but um, the time, there will be like the difference is usually in, in terms of the time, because the exhibited one is going to be in a shorter time, while the comprehensive one uh, might be, you know, taking a longer time. And in general speaking, uh, the IRB review process usually takes a lot of time. It might take from three months up to six months, and it might even in some institutions be longer. So those who are planning to conduct a research that require uh, an, an IRB review, such as um, clinical trials, cohort studies, and big researches that um, require the IRB approval, they need to put this in mind while submitting a research protocol for review because um, if you are planning to submit this to something that's coming up, if you're planning to get a grant and the grant is limited with a certain amount of time, uh, so the, the researcher need to be, or the principal investigator need to be putting this in mind while going for this process. Uh, so, the like with, with regard to the full review, federal regulation and institutional policies requires a review by the RB full board for application where the research involves more than a minimal risk to human subject, and it does not meet the criteria for no, for one of the categories that meet the criteria for the exhibited review, um, or also the one that has been referred to a committee by an exhibited review or the chair, regardless of the risk of the level, the IRB may require full board review when the research involves either vulnerable populations, particularly prisoners, as I mentioned, and sensitive topics, including um, illegal behaviors, which may require a uh, National uh, Institute of Health certificate of confidentiality, 
to protect subjects' data from compelled disclosures. Um, so in general, also, we do have um, a lot of bodies in the U.S. mainly that they do, um, you know, regulate um, they regulate research, the conduct of research. We have federal uh, bodies and we have the non-federal bodies such as the NIH or National Institute of Health that they do um, make a lot of rules, a lot of protocols um, for the researchers to follow in order to protect human subjects and in order to make sure that the research was done in a specific, um, you know, um, type of way that's uh, reasonable and it's scientific and it's professional. So research also um, involving genetics and genomic analysis in complex research design that requires the expertise of multiple board members to evaluate all those um, need or require for, for review. Um, so with regard to these the, the submission deadlines, um, some institutes, they do create a post on the submission deadline for upcoming IRB meetings and everything. So uh, the, the investigator need to be aware that about those uh, deadlines and they need to prepare their protocols and everything to be ready by those deadlines. Uh, if an application is board ready, meaning that it contains all of the information to the materials necessary for full board review to conduct its review, the application would be assigned to the next IRB meetings. Um, IRB staff assign submission to primary and secondary IRB review reviewer for presentation at the full board meeting which is the meeting during which they do discuss the protocols and they do discuss um, the, 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 the proposal or the protocol being submitted. And usually investigators may be invited to attend those meetings to answer the questions uh, from the board. Uh, so at the conclusion of the, of the meeting, the board votes and issues determination for the submission of the protocol or the project. Uh, so, after this, the RB full board determination, it's either approved for the submission at the beginning, and, and the approval date is the, uh, is the date of the RB review. And then it's either approved with, um, uh, with uh, contingencies. I mean, like they, they put certain uh, rules or sent certain things to be changed on, uh, on the protocol or in, in terms of the informed content or other supporting materials. Uh, and then this is, it's like bending for the final approval. Uh, and the final approval status is granted when the IRB has reviewed and approved all the requested changes. The date of the approved uh, with contingencies or the determination is deemed is the date of approval. Um, or either they make it, um, or they label it as action is deferred, which is means that the IRB needs additional information from the investigator before the IRB can make um, um, a decision or determination of where this study is supposed to be, you know, going. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so the principal investigator must submit the requested um, additional information before the IRB will consider the application for further review. This is the case that we mentioned, the deferred approval. Um, it might also be disapproved. That means the protocol does not provide adequate protection to human subjects, and it's unlikely that it can be modified to provide such protections. The IRB notifies the principal investigator of the disapproval in writing, including the statement of the reason for its decision, and provides the opportunity for the investigator to respond to the IRB in person or in writing. Um, um, also, um, sub certain projects would be tabled. That means like the IRB full board did not have the time to review the application. It is um, it's put like, or like it's placed on the upcoming agenda on the next IRB meeting to be approved. Um, after the full board, um, the full board review or the comprehensive review, also there is the exhibited review. And this is like, um, as I mentioned, the full review might take a lot of time. So the exhibited review might be, you know, something that's kind of, um, you know, faster and certain research do um, meet 
uh, the criteria for the um, exhibited review type. Um, there are federal regulations that authorize the use of an exhibited review process, mainly for uh, projects that has a minimal risk uh, on human subject that meets one or more of certain, you know, uh, review categories called OHRB. Uh, minor uh, changes to research previously approved by the full board, uh, as the one that we talked about previously. Uh, so if the if the one or the one that has already undergone full or comprehensive review uh, needs only minor changes, um, the investigator might apply for an exhibited review. Uh, applications qualifying for exhibited review are assigned to an exhibiting reviewer and experienced IRB members appointed to the role by the IRB chair. Um, the exhibited reviewer has the authority to make a determination or to refer a submission for a full board review for multiple purposes, either clarification or expertise, uh, including the cases of disapprovals. Only the full, the full board has the authority to disapprove a study. Most of the studies that qualify for exhibited review process do not uh, require annual continuing review which is something that they do like even after, you know, um, the protocols meet the criteria for I, for the IRB and, uh, you know, for the IRB um, things that they have put or rules that they have put um, every time or every annually, um, the IRBs uh, do make a continual reviewing of, of most of the projects that's happening in that institute. Uh, so, and also, while the, the project itself is being conducted, uh, the IRB usually, um, you know, has a follow-up uh, to certain projects that require the follow-up. Um, so as we mentioned, the exhibited review, um, its determination is easier um, in addition to, um, like in addition to being, um, to the above and above risk contingencies determination, just like the previous one, reviewer may issue changes um, requested uh, determination when substantial changes to the application or material required before exhibited review can approve the study. Um, so um, the exempted research, um, so certain researches are, um, they do have like they're exempted from review, uh, whether exhibited or for review. So usually it's per institute policy, the investigator must, must submit an IRB application for determination of exemption before the research begins. Applications are voted for exempt review through the interaction or intervention application or the secondary use of application type. Uh, IRB recommends uh, using the brief protocol for exempt research projects to provide an, ev an overview of um, the exempt project as a data uh, entry guide when completing the IRB applications. Uh, so there is like the, the exempt research, um, the research that they're exempted from the uh, review, um, the IRB still requires them to submit a brief protocol for the for the exam research um, review. And then after that, um, if it's deemed that the project does meet the criteria for federal exemption uh, categories, uh, which is um, they're just um, conditions that um, inter like nationally in the US by federal law that has been put. And then if certain project does meet those criteria, then the IRB might approve it or disapprove it or this is depends on the pre protocols that have been submitted. Um, there is this section of the um, of the federal law um, exemption uh, may be granted um, a determination of exemption by the IRB or where applicable through a system generated review process. So previously I mentioned also there is a different type of review process which is a system generated review process uh you know certain um uh, bodies such as the NIH or the federal bodies they do have uh, a computerized system that certain researches they don't even go further if there is certain uh, points that's present in the research they get filtered other ones they get uh, past the system and then after that um they go to the 
determination process. The review determination, whether uh, conducted by the IRB or a system generated, is limited in the scope to information necessary to determine if the proposed exemption applies. The IRB does not review uh, informed contents, documentations, or recruitment materials for proposed exempt studies. Exemption may be granted by the IRB chair, uh, exhibited to the reviewer, or qualified RB staff members. Uh, projects receiving an exam determination are not subjected to the continuing review process, as I mentioned, because they are already, um, you know, applying for something that's like, uh, they're not even going to be reviewed. So the continuing review process that happens annually or while the project is going on, uh, it does not apply in this situations. Um, amendments are required only if changes to the project would alter the exemption criteria. An exam determina uh, determination does not license the researcher ethical application to participate as an articulate in the parliament uh, reports um, or the codes of the conduct for specific disciplines. Uh, research involving prisoners or certain type of research with children, such as minors, uh, surveys, in interviews, observation of a public behaviors where the investigator interact with children does not qualify for exemptions because those type of researches they do um, you know um, involve uh, minors or you know sensitive parts of the community. Uh, there is also the limited IRB approvals, which is just something in between. It does not uh, qualify for exemption. It does not qualify for a full review. So. The common rule provides, um, there is this thing that's called the common rule um, in, in, the, in the research, um, you know, in research uh, conduction um, rules in, you know. So it does provide a limited IRB review process, which is a required exhibited review of a recruitment and a consent material, as, a, as well as plans to maintain participants' privacy and data confidentiality for example, two and three projects that collect or use sensitive and identifiable data. An exempt determination is issued when the exhibited review confirms that these protections are acceptable. So it's just, um, this is uh, saying that, um, you know, certain, certain uh, researchers has to go through uh, some type of a review and then after that they can get an exemption after a limited um, amount of review. Um, there are researches that are not regulated and you yourself might be involved in this type of research that I would, uh, I would talk about later. They do not require IRB approval or they don't have to go through all this process. So as I mentioned, not all research related activities that involve people, their data or their biospacement, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, are covered by the regulation governing human research. However, investigators may wish to submit a brief, um, you know, uh, research IRB approval for a formal, not a regulated determination, either for funding or for publication publication purposes, or the investigator may be able to issue system generated determination later without submission to the IRB. In those activities are such as in case studies or case reports, for example, uh, class activities, uh, journalism or documentary activities, oral history, quality assurance and quality improvement activities, research on organizations, research using de-identifiable, as I mentioned earlier, they are called de-identifiable or encrypted um, data or biospacement that um, I mean like using them as a secondary, this is called um, like using the, like the retrospective cohort studies and those that they do not require uh, taking direct information from patients, but rather to use secondary data. Research is uh, using publicly available data sets. And some categories that require IRB review for the purposes of assessing compliance with HIPAA or other regulations apart from the one I mentioned. And those they include, uh, HIPAA is the um, one that's responsible for protected, for the health protected uh, informations. 
so research involving existing information, as I mentioned, or biospecimen that has been coded before the researchers receive them, but identifiers exist, such as, you know, using um, patient records, and those are not identified by names. Maybe they're put in the MRN numbers or certain codes are given to those data and you don't know which person is which. So those are the identifiable information, such as the one that used for the retrospective cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, and this type of studies. Research involving diseased individuals only, uh, pre-review of clinical data sets, preparatory to research, standard public health surveillance or preventive activities, uh, for a complete list of not regulated researches, uh, also I have put the link uh, down here. Uh, you might uh, also go through it. So just to sum up, um, you know, the IRB process is a very long process and usually um, we need to submit um, a protocol or a proposal uh, for the IRB in order to make sure that uh, our research is in shape. And then after that, um, um, the the project is deemed to go or assigned to the different type of the review based on the based on the criteria and based on the content of the project itself it's either go through full review it's either go through an exhibited review if it does meet the criteria or it's either being exempted from the review or maybe if it's not regulated um um maybe it just um you know you don't need to go through the irb process um, it's a very long process, and I try to summarize it as long as possible. Um, and I hope um, you know I like it was beneficial. Um, if you guys have questions, uh, I might answer them. Excellent. Thank you so much for great presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadir. So uh, I started uh, with MSCO IRP in the past with uh, some of my projects. So basically, it's the type of forms that you need to fill uh, or, or answer the questions. And it's very uh, detailed. So yes. you need to uh, as much as you can give more details to the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, when you submit the form, it will be sent back to you so that for clarification. So mm -hmm. when you plan your uh, study, uh, try to give as much information to the IRB so that it can be done faster. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. And also like certain institutes, they do have like, um, like the protocol itself, it does vary from an institute to a different institute. So like before writing the research protocol itself and submitting it to the RB, um, it's very important to know like uh, what are the, uh, the rules that govern uh, within the certain institutes. For example, let's suppose University of Michigan, they do have, um, you know, certain type of um, criteria that has to be in the protocol itself, certain way that need to be followed. So each institute might differ in, in terms of the writing, in terms of preparing their protocols. And hence, um, this also does have a big say in the determination of the approval or the disapproval from the IRB. You guys are welcome. Um, is there is any question regarding the 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 RB um, process? I'm going to just uh, follow up with some examples here and share share the screen. So here at MSU we have the uh, RB. Um, website where when you have the project ready, you can use some of the templates. So you just click submit. Uh, so some of the templates uh, are explained to you uh, for new studies, what type of protocols are there. So you click on 
the one that you think uh, applies to you. Uh, as the Dr. Faida mentioned, uh, which one you want to use to exam and expedite or for uh, studies. And some, they have instruction, the protocol, some don't. So initially, I'll go with the one that has some of the instruction. And so each question will be uh, explained to what possible answers. So you can apply your own answers, but they can guide you um, in one specific way. So you don't give a general answer. Uh, otherwise, uh, they will uh, give you a feedback that you need to give more information. So it's going to be back and forth. Uh, between you and the uh, uh, IRB and Google. And it's a process. Sometimes it takes some, I mean, it takes some time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So the second agenda, if no one has question, um, like the second agenda is the, the poster presentation. So I would like to do it by example. I already have a research project that we worked in. So I'll try to do a poster presentation. And at each step, I'm going to, um, you know, stop and, um, and try to, you know, highlight the points. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. 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 So this is a research that we've been working on um here at the like um at the the Nigeria Research Fellowship. Um, it's mainly intended to, you know, look at the um, the long COVID, part of the long COVID, which is known as the neurocognitive uh, implications of COVID-19. So we're all like, um, you know, going through all the process. Um, at some point, we have to do poster presentations, whether at the residency, whether before the residency, or after the residency, or during a work career. And so it's very important um, to know like how to do the poster presentation in general. Um, so for me, um, usually um, every research project does start with the research, um, you know, um, with the research title itself. So usually um, like within the presentations, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so within the presentations, you have to just start with the title um and even before the presentation um like the way that the poster has to be is usually determined by the specific body uh to which we submitted uh the 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 abstracts uh, most of the time we submit the abstracts and usually present the abstracts so each um for example the word like um i participated in the word congress of neurology before so the word congress of neurology they do have a certain template uh, for those who want to submit their proposals, um, and this template it has to be followed. And um, for example, they 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 usually start with the title, and then go to the background, and then after that they have the methodology, and then after that they have the results and the conclusions. This is like they put certain sections uh, for the for the abstract to be you know organized in. And also they do have a certain word limit. So as while you're submitting your abstract, like even before the presentation, you need to know, like usually when we do a research project, the information is usually a lot. So we need to know what type of information or highlight that I need to put in the abstract or the poster that I'm going to be presenting later on. And how can I extend on those informations that I put? So it's very important to even think about the presentation at the submission um, at the submission stage. 
Um, so each presentation usually starts, as I mentioned, with the title. Uh, the, the title in this research, it was the new cognitive implications of COVID-19 or uh, infection, which is uh, a systematic review that has um, with an insight into the passive physiology. Um, so most of the reposted presentation or most researchers abstracts does have uh, or does start with a background about the condition itself, about um, the thing that we want to talk about, which is going to be in the abstract. So usually um, in this, let's suppose um, in my case, um, it was the COVID pandemic has been affecting millions globally. Beside other presentations of long COVID, uh, evidence shows that persistent cognitive impact imposing further clinical and psychological challenges. So the background has to also convey that, um, you know, uh, what this research is talking about. So if if we are in what are, like, why are we focusing on this? So if we look at this research, I have already talked about what it is COVID, all right, in the magnitude of the problems. And then um, I said that COVID, like in a bigger scale, COVID does have a lot of presentation with regard to long COVID. But um, I came or I, I narrowed down that um, some evidence shows that there is a pers persistent cognitive implications. And why those cognitive implications are important is that because they impose further clinical and psychological challenges. So within just those four lines, I was able to reflect because I do have a limited number of um, you know, of words that I want to use. So I reflected the magnitude, the magnitude of the problem and why is it important or um a, or the way of the affections and then why is it important? And after that, um, the objective of this study is uh, was aimed to, and usually the, the objective as part of the background, it has to be as clear as it is because it tells the reader or it tells the person who is going or listening to the presentations that what this research is going to focus on. So the, this study aimed to explore the available evidence of neurocognitive symptoms observed in COVID-19 patients and determines the pattern of occurrence of those symptoms. Uh, it was also aimed to explore the underlying pathophysiological mechanisms behind these symptoms and to assess the correlation between the severity of COVID-19 and the need of cognitive implications. So if you're going through those, um, you know, through those uh, aspects, um, you can know like what this study is uh, focusing on and at the same time uh, as a presenter I have to um, even if it's not written clear I have to put it in a bullet point and then explain to the reader in a very brief and well um, you know explained way that what are the aims of those studies and with regard to the methodology um, the methodology also has to be very well um, you know explained because this determines how did we conduct this research? I mean, like, um, was it right? Did we use the right steps? Because um, if the methodology is good, then the whole, like the validity and the, the trust that can be given to this research is uh, valid. So this study was a systematic review that followed the PRISMA or the preferred uh, reporting items for systematic review and meta-analysis guidelines. Uh, we used a comprehensive search in an electronic database using Google Scholar and PubMed from the years 2020 to 2023. Um, and this was done by six uh, investigators using a mesh, shirt, um, mesh search. So within those lines, I was able to explain what did we use as a guideline, uh, how did we do did the, the gathering of data, who did it, um, the, the time window that we used, um, so it has to be as clear as this one. Um, also, we like in the process um, with it with regard to the inclusion criteria. Um, I mean, like um, in the methodology, as I mentioned, it has to include what was was the study in the process what we did, and also we need to explain the inclusion criteria. For example, in this study, and it's not it does not have to go through this. Like each study is gonna be different like the systematic review might need 
to have those items reflected. Um, case reports, for example, does not have to go through this. Um, Cross-sectional studies does not usually have to, you know, follow those similar steps. So um, we included the studies. Um, okay, I, even after finishing the systematic review, I can share one of the case reports I have uh, presented to show how different they are. So we included um, studies written in English focused on adult patients over 18 years of age who, ex uh, who had um, exhibited neurocognitive health impacts following COVID-19 infections. And they were assessed through full neurological physical examination uh, use, using uh, cognitive tests like the minimental status, uh, examination, and others. Uh, also, we considered studies that they evaluated the pathophysiological effect of COVID-19 on the brain to assess the quality of selected studies we employed the CASP and GPI checklist. Uh, this is for the uh, uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, also, data analysis was conducted manually by the investigators. Um, so this is pretty much uh, about the methodology. Um, it was brief and it kind of conveyed um, the the steps, um, you know, that has been conducted during this systematic review and it conveyed um, what's already has been written, for example, in the Prisma, uh, uh, in the Prisma protocol for writing an abstract for a systematic review. And so, as I mentioned, uh, certain systematic reviews has to follow uh, the protocol either from the from the body that you're submitting it to, um, or if it's a systematic review, it has to follow the Prisma guidelines. If you're submitting it to certain papers or to certain journals, or you're submitting it to certain conference. Okay, so... With regard to the res to the, the results, um, out of the th the four hundred thirty five studies, one hundred and eleven studies investigating the neurocognitive impact of COVID nineteen and its pathophysiology were examined. So in this, I conveyed that we have seen initially four hundred and thirty five studies, and then, um, you know, later on um, after the sensitivity analysis and everything, we came up with 111 studies that we included in the final analysis. Um, within this uh, study, several neurocognitive uh, symptoms were reported, most commonly being the executive dysfunction, memory loss, attention deficit, fatigue, anxiety, delirium, and delay in processing speed. Other symptoms were also identified. So just Within this slide, um, I mainly mentioned the most common findings that we found. And because the neurocognitive symptoms were a lot, I was not able to list everyone on this because on the abstract, we have to be as brief as possible. So I mentioned it as other symptoms, which are the other non-common symptoms that were identified. Um, so the second part was the pathophysiology part, the exact pathophysiological mechanism behind the cognitive implication is not clear. However, the review collected evidence that suggests several potential mechanisms uh, are involved. Uh, certain studies talked about the virus entering the CNS through either the olfactory nerve or using the vascular endothelial cells or the immune cells. And by this way, the virus does break the blood-brain barrier and it binds to those cells and reach the, C the CNS through binding to the ACE or the angiotensin converting enzyme type 2 receptor on the brain, uh, on those uh, cells. Uh, and once on the brain, the virus can affect the brain through various mechanisms, either directly or indirectly. Directly, the virus does replicate uh, within the the neurons and the glial cells and the astrocytes and indirectly by the um, results of the immune system or the inflammations that ha that's triggered by the virus replication or the virus entering the sinus or the complete uh, body immune response in a form of the cytokine storm that involves cytokines such as IL-6, TNF-alpha, uh, inter um, interleukin 1b or the immune dysregulations as this inflammatory process goes on, the vascular changes, the low oxygen tension, the brain hypermetabolism, the neurotransmitter imbalances, executive stress, and even some studies showed that amyloid deposits are present on those patients who develop the neurocognitive implications. And all this 
mechanisms combined, they lead to the neurocognitive implications. Um, also, interestingly, we found that certain studies um, correlated the severity of the COVID-19 infection itself with those near cognitive symptoms, and also certain psychotic um, conditions such as depressions and anxiety are present on those patients who had the neurocognitive implications. Um, also, they emphasized, certain studies emphasized on the role of certain neuroimaging, such as the PET scans, in understanding the cognitive effect of COVID-19. And this is um, usually through mapping the areas in the brain affected of those who have uh, those neurocognitive symptoms. Um, so to sum up for this study, um, that this study yield um, document showed that the neurocognitive sequel of COVID-19 are well documented, although there are many hypotheses has been made with regard to the mechanism through which um, the passive physiology is, um, you know, implicated. But more data is needed for the extent of the impact, including the use of um, validated cognitive tests before and after uh, the COVID-19 infections. So just to sum up, um, the poster presentation, it has to convey everything that happened in the research from the idea formulation to the objectives, to the methodology, to the way that there are important aspects of the research uh, when it comes to the results. Um, and all this, it's the responsibility of the presenter is to convey to the other person because uh, we do have a limited number of um, words we need to use and we do have a limited number of time that we need to use to convey all these ideas. So we need to pick um, the most important, um, you know, we need to pick the most important uh, aspects of the project and then to present it. Um, so it's the, 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 it's the responsibility of the presenting also. Um, also, I do have another research that I'm gonna share, a case report to show just a different way that we can, uh, you know, present data. Um, if, um, if there is anyone who has a question so far, before we go to the case report. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Dr. Rufaida. Okay. So let me share one of the case reports. All right, so let me share my screen again. It's not shared, yeah, no it is. It, okay, okay, okay. So this is one of the, um, the abstracts that I presented at the previous World Congress of Neurology. So as you can see, like this was the template for the uh, WCN that they required us to use in order to present our abstracts. Um, so um, the, the research that I was working in in Sudan with one of the professors in Sudan, Professor Bashar Hussain, um, it, was, uh, it was titled Malaria Among Adult Sudanese COVID Patients. Um, this was conducted at the, um, you know, Daoud Research Group as one of their projects. And as you can see that, um, in this, um, you know, in this uh, conference, they had this template uh, through which you need to start with the title, then the name of the authors, and then the name of the presenting authors, 
and then their affiliations, their different affiliations. Um, so um, also they 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 have put you know like um, headlines that I needed to follow, which included the backgrounds and the aims, the methodology, the results, and the conclusions. And all this had to be in two hundred and fifty words. So I was um, able to you know to do my best to show the information that we gathered with regard to this research and those 250 words. So it's very brief and very summarized. Um, so as a background and aim, uh, malaria can occur on the top of COVID-19. Um, the link, the, the aim was to assess the possible link between malaria and COVID-19. Um, the method, this was a retrospective cohort study conducted among other Sudanese patients, COVID-19 patients attending three tertiary hospitals between the 4th of April, 2020 to the 15th of January, 2021. And 87 uh, patients were included. Uh, among the 87 patients, we found that 64.9% were male, while 35.6% were females. 86.1% um, uh, they were tested for malaria, and 27.6% were positive, they had a positive blood film. 64.7% of the patient had um, plasmodium falciblum malaria, while 35.3% they had plasmodium vivax. Uh, the number N was 75% of those who tested. 52.9% um, of the patient showed positive um, real-time PCR and CT findings for um, COVID-19. Uh, so with regard to the presentations, um, Mainly for me, uh, this study was aimed to look at um, the presentations of COVID-19 and the presentations of malaria and how similar they are and how similar the complications that can arise from this study, uh, from this, uh, you know, diseases, um, as they do mimic each other very well. And this might render the provider, you know, uh, in missing one of the other. So with regard to the presentations, uh, general, generalizable fatigability was the most common symptoms in 52.9% of malaria patients, followed by headache, nausea, fever, chills, shivering, vomiting, and diarrhea, which was in or corresponding to 42.5%, 36.8, 20.7, 12.6, 9.8, 7.8, 9 respectively. Uh, comparatively, on the other hand, among COVID-19 patients, 85.1% they had fever and fatigability, followed by cough, headache, shortness of breath, sore throat, myalgia, chest pain, and diarrhea, which were corresponding to 73.6%, 73, 73.8%, 59 59.8, 52.9, 20.7, 20.7, 10.3, 5.7, respectively. Um, so with regard to complications um, that's related to malaria, 13.79 had um, malarial pneumonitis followed by pulmonary edema, choleric malaria, thrombocytopenia, and malaria-induced hepatitis in 10.39%. 9.2, 9.19, 6.9, respectively. 8.4% had cerebral malaria. This is neuro the neurological complications. While, um, yes, 8.7% had um, cerebral malaria and cerebellitis. Uh, comparatively, the complications of COVID-19 were in a form of ARDS, heart failure, pulmonary embolism, stroke, encephalitis, uh, convulsions, which were in 44.8%, uh, 17.2%, and 8%, 8%, um, 3.9, 1.1 1 .1 of COVID-19 patients, respectively. Uh, so to sum up, malaria and COVID-19, they both can share um, with regard to presentation. They have similarities with regard to presentations, complications, which may render one being in diagnosis and undertreated and with undesirable sequel. So this is a different form of studies that included, um, this was a retrospective studies apart from the systematic review that I presented earlier. And so this is just to show you that like how a different um, study can be presented. And the third one I have is, um, I'm sorry, um, it's, um,
um, okay, it's this is the case report that I was actually looking for. So this um, abstract, um, it was a case report of RNA TRI malformation type one, which was associated with syringomelia, syringobalbia, and migraine in a 34 years old Sudanese female. Uh, so you can see that uh, the way that this is one is presented is different because um, like when we come to the background, um, mainly I talked about that this is RNA TRI malformation, which is a heterogeneous group of disorders that um, occur due to a hindbrain displacement. Uh, up, to, um, up to date, there is no reported case of RNA TRI malformation that had the combination of syringomelia, syringobelbia, and migraine in a single case. So here I'm talking about what am I talking about and why this is important. So in the methodology, it's not it's unlike the 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 other two case the other two studies that I mentioned. Uh, it mainly says it's a case report. So when it comes to the results here, also it's kind of tricky. It's different from the other studies we talked about. I mainly talked about how this patient presented. So a 34 years old Sudanese female presented to the neurology outpatient complaining of pins and needle sensation since 11 years. That's associated with episodic hotness involving the right face, upper and, and um, right face, right upper and lower limbs, headache since four years. That was right sided eating with a photophobia and phonophobia, but no auras, nausea, or vomiting. Also, right sided weakness that happened since two years more in the upper limb than the lower limb, but it does not involve the face, which brought the patient to medical attention. Uh, yield was six, which is uh, labeled as a mild depression. On clinical examination, revealed the right sided hemiparesis, impaired spinocylamic tract sensation on the right side of the body, and cranial nerve. Hello? Yes, we can hear now. Yeah, we couldn't hear you. You couldn't hear me. Yeah, now, now we can hear you. Yeah. For <laughs> two minutes, we couldn't hear you, yeah. Okay, at what, like, uh, until we're, like, in, like, until- I think it was the clinical presentation, the last thing that I heard, and then afterwards it kept coming back and forth. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. So the clinical presentation, is it until the part of depression or, okay, let me just start it from all over again. So this, this one is different, as I mentioned, as it started with a background about the patient, mainly it spoke about the history uh, that a 34 years old Sudanese female presented to the neurology outpatient complaining of pins and needle sensations since oh, 11 oh. years. Can you share the screen again, please? Okay. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. That's okay. Okay, can you hear, can you see now? Yes. Okay. So, um, so like, um, so this is a case report that I have mentioned that I like, um, like uh, I presented at the previous uh, World Congress of Neurology. So as you see, like the way of the way that this the case report is different from the you know systematic review and the retrospective cohort study. So um, it started with a background and then 
um, the methodology, it's mainly case report. Uh, but if um, the, the results are not a lot, uh, it can be tricky because uh, in case reports, sometimes we, we need to talk about how did we do those, like how did we conduct this, um, you know, like how did we evaluate the patients, um, the history, how the history was done. Like for example, this patient mainly um, neurological um, history and clinical examination was conducted, MRI was done, but because, you know, I had a limited amount of words, um, I tried to mainly write case report in the methodology and then to let the other, to, to use the other words in the results section because the results section is very condensed. So it varies because um, if there is no a lot of data with regard to the results, maybe um, a presenter, post a presenter might expand on the methodology section. So a 34 years old Sudanese female presented to the neurology outpatient complaining of pins and needle sensation since 11 years. That's associated with episodic hotness involving the right face, upper and lower uh, limbs, headaches since four years. That was right-sided, pulsating with photophobia and phonophobia, but no aura, nausea, or vomiting. Also, she had right-sided weakness that since uh, two years, more in the upper limb than the lower limb, but does not involve the face, which brought her to the medical attention. Uh, the patient also developed difficulty in swelling to both solid and liquid, with shocking since nine months. She otherwise has no additional neurological uh, symptoms, interestingly. Although, um, as we can look here in the MRI, that this patient had a very long syringe that extending from the brain stem until, um, you know, the, the spinal cord, um, um, she only presented, you know, she only presented with the symptoms of a uh, right-sided uh, hemiparesis and right-sided hemisensory loss. The other side, the left side is not involved. And the only thing that has in terms of bulbar symptoms is um, difficulty in her swallowing, which is not was not present from the beginning. It developed later on. Um, so it's very interesting uh, that this is not the typical case of seringomelia or seringobulbia that would present uh, with, um, you know, with uh, the cape distribution. And at the same time, it's not the typical case that does present with the, um, when in terms of seringobulbia is presenting with Horner syndromes and other um, cranial neuropathy. Um, she other, um, okay. She otherwise has no additional neurological symptoms, as I mentioned. Uh, for the past nine months, she had some depressive symptoms, and her PHQ-9 um, yield was six, which is mild depression. Uh, so when we go to the clinical examination, she, um, there was right-sided weakness confirmed by clinical examination. Also, she had an impaired only spinocelemic sensation um, on the right side of the body while the dorsal column was intact. Um, uh, the right side of the body and cranial nerve. Um, later, she had cranial nerve five, nine, and ten affection, which, um, you know, was not very much uh, apparent in the examination, or I mean, like, which was not very much apparent uh, at the beginning in the examination, as in the history, as I mentioned. So the brain MRI also showed tonsillar herniation of a one centimeter um, below the foramen magnum, which confirms that this is uh, arnitary malformation type one. And the spinal MRI had, there was a sirens that extending from C1 to D9 and D10. Uh, she underwent uh, posterior fossa decompression and later she developed this arteria. So with regard to the result, I presented from here, like um, how the, the patient presented with the history uh, and the highlights in the clinical examination that was present and what was done for this patient and the results of what was done for this patient, because this patient is interesting. And also the procedure that the patient underwent and the, 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 the after the procedure, what did she develop? And in conclusion, the coexistence of syringomedia, syringobalbia, and migraine are rare presentations that are associated with arnitiary malformation type 1 and has unique neurological and neurosurgical implications which require special attention. So to sum up, as you can see, like the case report is kind of different. It's not the same statistic that I was mentioning with regard to the systematic review and the cross-section study. And the way that we can present um, certain case reports 
um, also um, a huge part of it also blade from the literature we do because the literature shows you uh, what aspects is already present in the literature and what aspect you need to be focusing on uh, when it comes to you know uh, presenting the findings that you have. So this is pretty much um, for the two agenda for today. If anyone has question, I'll be you know happy to answer. Okay, Neda, you can go. Uh, Dr. Rafael, I just had a question regarding when you did like the systemic review, it seemed more kind of like a PowerPoint or a slideshow. Is that usually how it works for a poster for a, a systemic review or is it because of the requirement for the submission was to do it like that? No, um, actually, this is not the submitted version. The submitted version was um, we submitted this actually poster to the annual, um, you know, annual A in uh, meeting. Uh, so they do have um, um, a sections in the AAA meeting that um, that we need to enter the information. Um, like they do have like 300 words limit and then they do have certain sections. So the headlines was the same for the AAA, but the slide presentation, I just put it in the slide in order for me just to present it to everyone. Uh, to show them like um, how can we present um, like what we need to include in the poster presentation, but otherwise, um, usually as I mentioned, it's dependent on who we want to submit it the the poster to. Is it the AAM? Is it the you know for example the World Congress of Neurology and other societies that we're submitting the 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 abstract to? So it's mm. pretty much um, yeah, it's pretty much. Um, objective uh, by the rules and the guidelines they do give. Uh, I see. So it differs according to where you're submitting it. And of course, exactly. because it's like a systemic review rather than a case report, so you would have to include more details about specific aspects, like as you mentioned, methodology would be more in details and so yes. on. So you'd have to follow it as, as much as you can. Yes. So they would like, um, even like for the certain sections, they do have word limits. For example, for the methodology, they might have like 20 words limit or 30 word limits. It depends um, on, as I mentioned, on the person that you're submitting the abstract to. Um, and um, even the sequence itself, it depends. But um, at the end of the day, also, I would say even if they do have a word limit, it's up to the presenter to show us like which part do I need to focus on with regard to displaying certain informations. Mm -mm, I see. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Fagida. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, are there any questions? Any more questions? Dr. Nadia, do you have comments? I agree with you. Uh, so it depends on what, uh, when you submit your ask that uh, to these conferences, uh, what the requirement or what the setting there. So uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. So thank some, you. sometimes you can present in person just one poster, like print out, uh, maybe three foot, five four foot, or something. Uh, this presentation like uh, on a poster data format and you go in person to do that. Uh, sometimes uh, it may be uh, virtual where you will um, send uh, the same uh, slide uh, but one, one image um, and then you can um, talk so you will um, provide a video or uh, um, audio with the presentation, the, the poster, so you can present that specially. Sometimes they may offer you a two or three minute um, video, so you can record your video and you can do the same, but by the bit, you can go um, up to three, four, five slides, so you can just uh, divide your poster into some sections 
or fast, where you can talk fast one, fast two, and so forth. So it depends on the uh, conferences. Thank you. Go ahead, Captain Meda. Uh, I had another question regarding the poster. So, uh, are there certain types of research that usually they wouldn't need a poster for, or you cannot submit for a poster? Let's say I have, for example, a literature review. Can I still submit it for conferences for a poster, or is it more for specific types? We from we mentioned case separate. We mentioned systemic review and so on. Um. So, um, I would say, um. I am not familiar with that, but I know that like, uh, for example, like the WCN, they do have certain topics. They do specify mm -hmm. the topics, but I don't know if they do specify the study type, but I do know that like, for example, they do categorize topics and then they do specify if, for example, COVID-19 and neurological studies. Um, for example, um, if the study fits this section, you can present it. Um, for example, let's suppose um, the body is, um, so my expertise is, Within the within neurology, so that's why I talk about neurology a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> let's suppose that the study is within the context of cardiovascular diseases. So you might not be able to present it, for example, to the WCN unless the patient has neurological complications, stroke, whatsoever. But I don't know if there is. Uh, maybe Dr. Nader can answer that. But I don't know if there is a certain restrictions to the different study types. I see. Interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Faida. I didn't know about the specific topics as well, so that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I think uh, I agree with you, Dr. Faida. So each conference, they may have their own scope, or sometimes they call it teams. So they divide the topics in the categories when you want to submit, when you want to uh, see what they want to focus on. Uh, and then if your topic is uh, considered to be this uh, topic of teams, then you can submit and then present under this category. Um, I don't think there is a limitation as far as what type of study or case presentation or as long as you want to share your research, your finding with this uh, conference. Mm -hmm. Again, it depends on their focus area so sometimes they change from one year to another year uh, but in the last few years we focus on uh, COVID related things uh, in most of the conferences uh, I expect in the coming years they will be focusing on the artificial intelligence in these conferences so if you have any way of matching your work with something related to the means, including artificial intelligence, then you know, your chance, chances of being accepted and presented in that conference will be higher. So again, what I do is I will look at what happened last year. Let's say uh, I want to uh, uh, send my abstract to uh, the American Geographic Society. So I will look at last year, what topic they <clears throat> were uh, focusing on, and I can target one of these. Next time, let's say uh, they are going to accept the poster for uh, 2024. I will look at their website and see if they have similar topics or they added more new areas of themes. So, mm -hmm. depending on my project, I can target whichever area, themes, criteria they want to focus on and do it the same. When you look at what they did in the past, the posters presented in the past, you can have an idea about what type of format they accept. So they can you can modify or you can start your project according to what they accepted in the past, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. In other conferences, uh, like uh, educational conferences, they want uh, to present uh, both ideas and projects. Let's say I want to start uh, a course of doing education about artificial intelligence and medical graduates or whatever. So I'm going to do my research, my proposal as far as how can I do this 
study and I can submit this to the educational conference and they can accept that as the uh, preliminary of idea poster uh, with the uh, uh, condition that um, starting and next year I'm gonna present my work or my progress. So it's kind of uh, presenting only the idea and then next year you present the actual work and the finding and the result, the result of your idea, something like that. So some conferences might accept different format of the same research com uh, project that you are doing, for example. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. And from what I understand by idea, you mean like uh, a future project that you're planning on working on? That's correct, yeah. So oh, for example, okay. we, we presented at one of the conferences. It's uh, uh, NAT Greg, National Primary Care Physician Specialist in, in North America, like in the US and Canada. And the first time we talked about it, uh, this, uh, program. So we talk about how we can uh, get medical graduates uh, who are in between, like they finish medical school and they want to get into the residency. Uh, so we target this group with some uh, educational empowering them with some uh, tools in research area, in geriatric uh, particularly. Uh, and we send that as a proposal initially as first steps. So we accepted uh, students uh, and they accepted that uh, poster. And the next year we followed up with what we did to the whole uh, first year as far as mm -hmm. uh, how many students and uh, what they find on uh, what the difficulties, how we change, how we modify things and what the feedback and then present it the next year, something like that. Oh, I see. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader. I'm sure this will help everyone who's trying to decide on a new topic. So okay. we should be able to look into the conferences and see what they need. So thank you so much for your advice. <laughs> thank you for the question. Um, we have Dr. Rayan. She wants to share her abstract uh, with us. Um. Um, you can go ahead and share your screen, Dr. Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to um, just go off of what Dr. Rofeida said regarding the poster app uh, submissions. So she did a great job with the PowerPoint, but I know Nada had a question. So I'm just going to share um, the poster presentation that I submitted, um, that I presented, sorry, this year for the uh, American Academy of Neurology. Okay, let me just share it real quick. So when you submit to them, you submit the systematic review. And then from there, if they accept it, um, usually this is the format of the poster presentations. And so you'll have a very clear intro, objective methods, results, discussion and references. Um, like outline for poster presentations, I wanna say it's very similar depending on what conference uh, you're applying it for. The difference comes in the sense of um, when you're coming to print off the poster. So they have different like uh, requirements or um, you have to make sure that it's within like a certain uh, range. For the AAN, they actually had it where it was digital. So everyone had like um, a screen. They were able to zoom in and zoom out um, and talk about uh, the specific aspects of the poster presentation. But one thing that I realized with the poster presentation, people, when they come to your poster, they want to know the results. So this is uh, you know, your topic. So my topic was the effects of anesthesiology on postoperative cognitive dysfunction. So it was mostly like, what were the results? What was the outcome of the specific topic? What did you find out? And so I would say the emphasis lies on the results of the systematic review. Uh, there's people who presented uh, case reports, so uh, various things. And to add to what Dr. Nader said, um, they have different areas for like for a specialty so even within the AAN they had like a, a specialties for um, like cognition and then they had something else for like uh, seizures epilepsy so even within the conference they based it on 
uh, the different areas or the different specialties that you're focusing on. Uh, so I'll stop sharing. Um, that's all I wanted to show. Uh, and I also just wanted to quickly mention, I know Dr. Nadir, you had mentioned um, about submitting uh, an abstract or submitting a, a, a review and then um, finishing it the year prior. I know that last year we had worked on um, uh, like a, a submission that we submitted to AMDA well, with Dr. Akila, she was heading it on, where we wanted to look at the effects of uh, COVID-19 within the nursing home staff. And so we submitted our abstract and uh, with the conclusion, we had just noted that uh, we will be uh, conducting this uh, this assessment and then you know we will follow up at the meeting with the results that we have made. So again, you don't necessarily have to have it completed, but you can submit something and then just you know reference to I will have the results um, once uh, the conference is there for the presentation. So that's also another thing that you guys can keep in mind um, when wanting to come up with an idea for a systematic review. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you for your, um, you know, your great presentation as well. Bye. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ryan. And uh, that happened also with uh, one of the group in the first batch. Uh, they have also some ideas to work on collecting some data, actual uh, patient data. So we submit um, the first uh, autofit to ANDA, and then we did not hear, so we modified it, and uh, we still were doing the analysis. So we submit the um, track to AGS, the American Geographic Society, and they accepted the, the process uh, without finishing our data analysis. So uh, they gave us a period of two months or something uh, that we can finish our analysis and results and then submit it to them. And then they gave us and the full approval for uh, the acceptance. And then we presented that in the conference. So they are flexible as long as you follow what they want from you. Um, you can go step by step and you can find some assistance or some uh, acceptance from these uh, conferences and because they, they want you to get um, engaged in the research and uh, they want you to collaborate they want you to share with others so it's beneficial for them to have some of you uh, it's better for them to have a lot of input a lot of participation uh, from all um, presenters and then they can select which one is better, and then they can limit all if they have the space and the time they can accept, accept all. And this happened to all, um, most of the conference that we participate in, like the uh, Alzheimer's Association. I think they have a video where they can uh, share with you their areas that they are interested in, or themes or topics, categories. And then uh, in one of the videos, they mentioned that they accept all the abstracts submitted to them. Uh, and then they can verify and seek additional information or the results or whatever. So some of them are very flexible. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, just quickly to add to Nadir, as well as when you guys do go on the website for the uh, different conferences, there's always going to be like um, an email that will direct you to like that information. If you contact any of those people, they will reply like immediately because like Dr. Nadir said, they want people to be able to apply and they want people to have an acceptance. So I know like in the past, I've emailed, um, you know, uh, different uh, people who are in charge of the submissions for uh, conferences and they're more than willing to like uh, either clear up something that you're not necessarily understanding or just provide more information so that you're able to um, make sure that you guys meet all the criteria. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rayan and Dr. Nadir. Um, there, is, um, there is someone who has a question. You can unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. I just want to add a few things to the uh, explanation which was given by Dr. Rufta and Dr. Nadir. If you are starting a new paper, 
And if you want your paper to end up as a poster, when you choose a topic, try to choose a topic that will eventually have a public, uh, helps or public uh, uh, message. So that's why the last three or four years, most of the posters were about COVID, obesity, diet, AI, and other stuff. So if you are starting a paper, whether it's a systematic review or meta-analysis, and if you want your paper to end up being as a poster, uh, the topic that you choose would eventually be helpful if it have like a mass message or a mass effect or a public uh, message. That was my uh, first comment. And my second comment is, how do you make the poster? Most of the posters, you can easily do it on PowerPoint and uh, Canva. And uh, the third uh, uh, comment that I want to give to people who are thinking of making a poster is, most poster is just like a quick glance or a quick one or two minute uh, look of what you have done in your paper. And when you are presenting it, you don't necessarily have to go to too much detail, especially when people ask you, like, give me a one minute or two minute or three minute summary of your paper. You have to kind of like finalize and focus on the result, as uh, Dr. Ryan was saying. But uh, eventually, if people with expertise in the field or in the paper that you have done come and ask you, that's when you have to kind of explain everything in detail. So when you are ready with your poster and presenting it, the way how you explain it depends on to whom you are explaining. So I personally had an experience of presenting a poster. The first one hour or 45 minutes, I was trying to explain everything. The more I see into it, some people, they just want like a one minute summary. What's your paper about, what you do, and what did you find in the result section? And other people are real expert in that field. They just want to know like in and out of the whole paper. So even if you prepare a poster and you want to present a poster, uh, have like a three or five minute summary of what you are going to say. And if more questions arise from what you have presented, and then you can go into detail of explaining what your paper was about. Thank you. Yes, um, I totally agree. Um, you do have the responsibility of conveying like, uh, the highlights or the important information that you want to share about your projects. And as he mentioned also, um, um, you need we need to focus on something that adds to medicine, adds to the field that we are, you know, uh, working on because there are a lot of literature that does exist. And if you are to focus on, or if you are to create a new project, you need to focus on, uh, something that bridged the gap, something that has not been written in the literature. And this is also could be, um, you know, like you can know about it from the literature itself that it does exist. Um, you can know about the gaps, you can know about their, usually most of the times, a lot of uh, papers, they do talk about their limitations. They do talk about, um, you know, the areas that needs most, like they do have a recommendations. So this is also something that does give um, you know, a clue about where to put the fo your focus on when conducting a new research. And as um, Dr. Nood mentioned that um, certain, the conferences itself, they need something that's fresh. They need something that adds to medicine. And the, the, the more new the idea is, the more there is a high likability of having this um, research abstract being accepted. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't live near to the train station, so I'm really sorry for the noise. Um, so if there is anyone who has any further questions or addition. Go ahead, uh, one last point just to add, as long as you are done with your poster and especially if you fly out of your state or out of uh, the country, whether to Canada or USA, try to make use of the time that you got there because I keep on mentioning this a lot. You always go for about two, three or four day visit to the conference. So try to connect to people as much as you can. Try to sell your ideas, your achievements, your institution. And you might end up also finding maybe four or five people who are willing to work research in the future with you. So you don't necessarily have to be like standing and only explaining about your poster. You can attend other meetings, other literature reviews, other conferences within the conference where 
you can randomly meet people who have like the same interest with you, whether for residence application, for your research, or for a fellowship, or even for other projects. That would be very helpful for reconnecting with people, one. And secondly, uh, try to kind of announce that you are going to a conference maybe four, five, or six weeks before the real conference, either in your LinkedIn account or WhatsApp or uh, Twitter, whatever the platform that you use for that. Uh, sometimes people who previously work with you or who want to work with you may attend the meeting. So you will have like this home feel factor when you go to a conference or to a poster that you will not be alone standing just presenting a paper and going back to where it came from. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is a very valid point. Um, usually, like, for example, conferences like the WCM, they do have in a, a specific time of the day during which uh, for, I mean, poster presentation, not oral presentation, specific time of the day for poster presenters to be around their posters, because this is the break or the time that people get out of the big sessions and this stuff. So this is the time during which we do, you know, present our projects or, you know, take the presentations part. But otherwise, like, um, if you're a poster presenter, you can enjoy the rest of the, you know, the conference that are like so many um, connecting opportunities, especially with like, for example, if I'm focused on neurologists, uh, there will be a lot of neurologists who are Sudanese from all over the world that are coming. So it's a really great opportunity to connect. So if there is anyone who has any more additions? So I'd like to uh, share with you, I got an email. So sometimes you get invitation to uh, participate in these conferences uh, with poster or oral presentation. So I'm gonna share with you the email. Um, I'm gonna show the information. I'm gonna show the results so this is the email came from um, IASD, the International Exchange Specialty from where uh, World Congress. So they uh, are accepting process uh, um, proposals or products. So the deadline is January, end of January. And when you go to the website, they have the information that you just were talking about um, the requirement and the focus. So here's the, the first time uh, if you want to go ahead with your submission and then uh, the guidelines uh, for your submission. So uh, what you can do and what you cannot do. So they specifically mentioned the deadline so you have to do that and the um, submission in English. Uh, so no change after it's accepted. And then uh, sometimes they specify that the conference is in person or in uh, like uh, Zoom or some special platform or combination hybrid. Uh, so here's the, how you put your uh, steps, so you put a title, topic, and so forth. Authors, uh, as like details, and then if there is any sponsorship or something, so you review that and submit. And then uh, the list of the categories they they want to uh, you when you submit select which category, so that when uh, they get all these posters or abstracts they send it to a reviewer. So the reviewer will be uh, someone who specializes in that area. So let's say I'm a geriatrician, uh, I work with uh, patients with COVID. So in this case, they can send me all um, posters came under the category COVID and pandemic and so forth, if that makes sense. Um, it's different topics and different uh, categories here. Um, so this is one thing. Uh, the other thing is the conference itself, uh, as Noah and uh, Ryan and mentioned, you can be in person uh, for that um, conference. So you can be um, on the site of your 
posters explaining English asking questions. But at the same time, it's going to be as brief, like a two hour session every day or something like that. Uh, the rest of the day is yours. So you can go around, look at other uh, posters, talk to other presenters. Uh, and you can also connect with other people who would present orally, for example, or uh, you can meet some program directors uh, who attend these uh, conferences, for instance. Uh, so this is one part uh, that I want to share with you. The other part is this conference will be in, in, in uh, the Nesak lab. So they have some uh, awards or some travel uh, finance aid. So what we do uh, in our uh, program here is if you are submitting to a um, uh, conference that they want uh, someone to be in person, I think we can um, work together to include some of the fellows in that area. In the US, for example, if the next conference will be in Florida, maybe it's a good idea to have one of the fellows uh, get involved in the project who lives in Florida. So it's going to be uh, as far as travel wise, it's going to be easier, less expensive. In this conference, for example, this will be in Holland or Netherlands. So someone from the UK, uh, France, or some uh, fellows who are in the uh, Europe area, it's easier for them to go attend a couple of days in, in Holland, for example, uh, rather than. than uh, someone from the US to travel um, back and forth. So this is uh, another way of doing things in collaboration between you guys. Mm -hmm. So you think ahead if the, the conference is required to be in person, so you plan ahead who will be there and uh, how to minimize the cost and the uh, time on it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadir, for all the information. Um, by this, uh, we're gonna go to project update. If there is anyone who has, um, you know, a new project or working on a project that, you know, currently they they reach a new milestone or step, you can just share it with us. Mafaz, you can go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much, Freda, for today and like, the presentation were all very amazing. I had the um, the research about the e-cigarettes and its effects and all that we can find out about the side effects and its benefits. So currently we finished the, the introduction for the manuscript and the and the abstract. Um, we, I wanted to ask if, um, we could make it as an article rather than a systemic review because we don't have a form of result that we're looking for, but it's more of an article that's uh, conveying everything that's uh, been found from 2019 to 2023. So I wanted to see if that's uh, an applicable choice to do. So if you ask me, uh, I would um, try to make <laughs> what they call uh, hit two bears with one stone. So if you already started the, the project and your idea is to do a poster, it's going to be faster and it's going to be easier to get the project done, accepted, and presented. Uh, if you want uh, to give yourself some time to work on it and get more details and then convert that into a manuscript. Um, that would be also great. Um, and um, just uh, put in mind that it may take longer and which uh, um, journal you want to target and the possibility of accepting or rejecting that um, will be there. And if it's rejected, then you go to German number two, number three. So you have plan A, plan B, some uh, way of um, 
starting more than one journal just in case. Um, the best way to do it is you do both. So if you have a good enough people in your team, uh, so you are fine tag to team number one, where they will be working uh, faster and effectively started in one of the conference of making the poster in that sense. And that team number two will be working slowly, but effectively as far as uh, comprehensive look at what you have <clears throat> and turn that into a manuscript and also looking at what um, journal available there so that you can have a good impact with your um, paper if it's accepted. Uh, if it's rejected, you will have plan B as far as the next journal or the third journal if you are not successful uh, first time or second time. So this is my approach is uh, if you have the data, try to work hard faster to get it as a poster. Um, the chance of getting the poster accepted and presented is easier faster. And then you can modify your topic um, through the same data, but more extensive information you can send that into an um, script, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. So we can uh, start work on the abstract and make a poster and then uh, slowly work on the manuscript. Yeah. I also have, have an, uh, yes. If you have, uh, let's say 10, you can increase the number of um, participants. So you can get 20. So new fellows, they can join you and you can divide that. So team number one, 10 will be focused on the poster. Team number two, 10 people will be focusing on that. Paper, or maybe more people in the paper. There's no limitation in the paper, but the poster sometimes they have some limitation there. Yes, I wanted to ask about the methodology. So mm -hmm. our criteria would be the inclusion of any reports that's relevant from 2019 to 2023, with the exclusion of any um, experimental and on animal um, tests or controls, and also any uh, reports before 2019. So I wanted to ask um, about the rel the equivalent of Prisma that we use in systemic review and the meta-analysis. Is there a equivalent that we can use in the manuscript as we don't have a result? So. I'm important to play as far as um, your question. Uh, because in the methodology, um, mm -hmm. what sort of tool would we use because in the systemic review, we use the Prisma. Over mm -hmm. here, we don't have a result that we're looking for. We're just um, kind of bringing all the information together as an article or a manuscript. So I wanted to ask which type of tool that should we use in the methodology? You can just mention that um, the way you did that. So you work on getting the uh, literature um, reviews of uh, whatever available in this searching engine, whatever uh, that it is that we look at. Uh, and sometimes what people will do is when you find an article uh, that interests you, you look at the references in this article and see which one applies to you. So you can also include that as a reference. So you look up uh, in the references that available there. When when you are writing a paper, uh, there is no limitation as far as the method you are doing, uh, because the way you will present your method, you cannot analyze that at the end and see what limitations that you found in your method or uh, may subject your um, findings to a bias. Let's say you focus only on younger people or older people or the article in English or something like that. So in the limitation, you would say also we look at the literature, but we limit ourselves to this group or this language or something like that. So um, your article will elaborate on some of the steps that you did and what limitation you faced. Uh, so that when you generate your conclusion, 
uh, it's going to be kind of uh, balanced. Yes, perfect. It makes sense now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nadir, for uh, giving me the opportunity. Uh, now I'm working uh, with my team on uh, a bootstrap about uh, cardiac MRI uh, finding uh, after uh, post uh, acute nephrodactis uh, after second dose of. Uh, messenger RNA vaccine, COVID vaccine, and uh, we are making manuscript uh, about full uh, cardiac image, including MRI, echo, CT scan, and uh, positron emission tomography. And uh, now in the process of uh, registration, and at the same time we start uh, data gathering, and uh, are going to take it from there. Thank you so much for giving me this uh, opportunity to start this uh, project. You're welcome. Thank you for taking the task. And uh, the combination is one of the uh, graduate or doctors. Uh, he is interested in cardiology and he did some work in cardiology. So uh, it's going to be helpful using your expertise and uh, helping um, build up some literature, um, like often in building the literature. The, Question I have for you, did you reach out to Dr. Ali about the other um, manuscript or topic? Yeah, I connect with him. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, our title changed from uh, symbol uh, cardiac MRI finding into all the cardiac image, including the MRI, the echo, the positron emission tomography altogether. So uh, we include all, all, all together. But I, I contact him. He's responding in that Sounds issue. Good. Sounds good. So we are not going to uh, write two different um, manuscripts. Yeah, one, one paper, yeah. One paper. Okay, so, so, so this is what uh, we were just talking about when you have some data. Uh, so in the second batch of this fellowship uh, program, they work on um, two posters um, with collaboration with other colleges, uh, and they have been accepted in uh, some of the conferences. So these are two posters. Uh, we are trying to convert, uh, and my idea is convert each one to a paper, uh, so they can be um, elaborated, and maybe we can pick up more. Uh, so that's why. Ali, uh, he is one of the graduates from this program. He was also interested in cardiology fellowship. So I told him to connect with Dr. Minus so that they can work on getting these two posters uh, converted into papers. So hopefully, if you, uh, Munir, and your team, along with Dr. Ali, and anyone is interested in cardiology, maybe they can work with you getting this uh, manuscript. Um, that would be great. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, or any other updates? Uh, Hello, Dr. Nadir. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Kaila. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so there is this epilepsy application. Um, that um, we did, I did actually uh, formulated the team, and we also found the volunteer that is willing to help us to have a program version of the application, so as to make it able to, you know, to upload it in Google Play in app stores, and also we're targeting, um, you know, um, you know, um, Sudan population that they have. Uh, epilepsy. So we might have um, like Professor Abishar in the Outreach Research Group, they might um, also use the application in order to, you know, to see patients like a form of a telemedicine. So currently we're in the stage of just gathering the ideas um, and then soon like we're going to have a solid ground. Give me a second. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure, it's okay.
So thank you so much, Dr. Rafael, for sharing. Uh, this is great. So uh, again, you can uh, build your team if you think, but uh, we want to work on um, the basics of the app. So you already have the idea, you have the collaboration. Hopefully, uh, we can work with the professor to see that. And uh, maybe we can also uh, improve it in the future to get uh, some um, neurologists here in the US uh, from Sudan or other um, countries here uh, in the US so that they can collaborate. I know some graduates from the University of Toronto, uh, maybe they are in neurology. Uh, so they can collaborate in the future. But the idea of building that app itself uh, is great. So I want, if you have uh, a chance to connect me with the uh, volunteer who will be working on the development of the app for the uh, stores like Apple Store and uh, Google Play. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm working on uh, trying to get some of the three apps that we will um, successfully upload it then to Google Play. I want to see if we can convert uh, that to um, some of them or all of them to um, Apple Play Store or oh, Apple Play. It's, it's um, very tedious work for Apple and the way they want things done uh, as far as um, the app development and uh, acceptance is the thing. So, yeah, that's, that's actually amazing. Um, the volunteer is actually my brother. So I can I can ask him if um he like um if he can help with the other application like uh, regarding you know uploading it to the iOS and the different other platforms. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Doctor Um, and there is any other update? Ah, uh, yes, there is. Okay, go ahead, Jan. Uh, so inshallah, Dr. Nadif, um, my team and I were going to be presenting uh, the webinar on long COVID next week at 11 a.m. I'm going to share the poster this week. So, you know, it's open to everyone. If you guys are able to join, we'd be more than amazing. That's our message. So it's going to be uh, 7 a.m. Yeah, Saturday, December 9th at 11 a.m. Sounds good. Uh, you can see we use Zoom. Uh, so it's going to be a COVID or how? Uh, sorry, what did you say, Dr. Nath? How are you going to present or, uh, using Zoom or are you going to get it with COVID or live Zoom? No, it's going to be live via Zoom. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk on, uh, we're focusing on uh, three, so the musculoskeletal, the cardiovascular, and the neurocognitive effects of long COVID. Um, we're just going to introduce long COVID in general, and then uh, we're going to talk about the uh, three specific symptoms. Um, my team has like, done the research and everything, so it all should be ready. Um, and yeah, we're going to do it on Zoom, but in a way where like you're able to join, but it's going to be... Um, like the audience won't be seen. I'm not sure if that makes sense or not. Wow. It was similar wow. to how Dr. Da Da and the rest of the fellows did it last year. Good. Sounds good. So um, I am asking that because I can help with the recovery and uh, putting the uh, webinar online. Yeah, no, Thank that's you. amazing. Yeah, we can, we'll record it. We'll record it so that we um have it and if anyone missed it, they're able to watch it back. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Dr. Mahfaz. I just want to add one final uh, comment to what Dr. Mafaz was saying. So the most common search engine that we most of us use is Google Scholar PubMed. So recently, a good friend of mine had introduced me to a different search engine where the focus of your study will determine. So for example, if you are starting a research on a new drug or the drug that has been introduced 
before five or seven years, in base will be a very good uh, source for you because this search engine focus on biochemistry and the most of the time on new drugs. And if you want to see the the, 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 the data that you are collecting for research, depending on the ranking of the quality of the paper, Web of Sciences will be good. So there are also other uh, search engines such as Plus One and uh, Scopus, and there's also clinical trials which are specifically uh, designed to register specific concept of your research. So I will try to search. I will try to share it in the chat box. So, for example, if you are starting a new research on drug, even though most of the search engine incorporate the same findings in their list, but if, for example, you want to do things as fast as you can, or maybe in a short period of time, you will focus on a specific aspect of the the, the research. So I will try to share it. Like, for example, those of you who are working on drugs, even though PubMed and Google Scholar also incorporate different research in their search engine, it will be more easy for you if you use InBase, or if you want to rank your research, or if you want to do only clinical trials, then it will be more easy for you to filter the research instead of spending too much time, like four or five days on filtering from PubMed or Google Scholar. So I will share it in the chat box. Any other questions, any other comments, any other ideas or you know, suggestions? If none, then I'd like to thank you very much, uh, all the presenters and the moderator for this uh, great uh, uh, presentation and uh, your project together. Thank you all the attendees for this meeting, and I hope uh, it can be beneficial for all of you. And I'd like to thank those who will come there back to the as well. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful day or night. See you next week. Thank you, Dr. Nader. And thank you, everyone, for listening today. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again.